I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and I welcome you. My name is Jacob Friesen. I'm the lead pastor here at Moral Gospel Church. We are located at 755 St. Anne's Road in Winnipeg, Manitoba. We are glad that you have decided to join us for our weekly worship service. May God meet us here in the singing and in the preaching of the word. Good morning and welcome to Mora Gospel Church. We are so glad that you have joined us here in our time of worship this morning. Wherever you are, the Holy Spirit is right there with you. Even though we are apart, we are united as the body of Christ. And that is a wonderful mystery. I will not even going to try to explain that. I just believe it and I accept it. This past week was the first full week in January and it brought a lot of changes and challenges for students. Some kids are back in school full-time, some are at home part-time and doing some um, some work from from school and some from home so it's sort of the combo deal for home and school and so we're mindful of parents and students who are dealing with that kind of interesting divide or that kind of interesting split. And this past week was also Ukrainian Christmas and so Christos Radaicha to all of our Ukrainian friends and those who are connected to, uh, to that heritage and a Happy New Year, which is coming up this Thursday. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say Happy New Year in Ukrainian, so if somebody please be gracious and teach that to me at some point. This week is also full of all kinds of celebrations. We have a bunch of birthdays that are listed in our bulletin. Our young friend James Bain is having his birthday, and so is Steve Brandt and Andrea, our admin assistant here at the church, and Susan Thiessen, who is in Lindenwood Manor, and Doug Walker, who's also part of one of our worship groups. So we want to wish all of you a very happy birthday, and however you celebrate, that it would be meaningful and, uh, and a good time with those around you. And yesterday was the wedding for Joel Thiessen and Ashley Penner, and so with, for them too, we wish them God's blessing and direction as they build their marriage and start this new chapter in their lives. You'll notice in your bulletin that there's things like the special projects funding and uh, uh, some information about that, as well as uh, a note for those of you who are looking for possibly to get some communion elements when we have communion for the first Sunday of every month. Um, there's also contents in our mailboxes, so if you would like to have either the communion elements and or your mail brought to you, we would love to do that for you, so please contact the church office or the names that are listed in the bulletin. Those are congregational care members, and so we would be happy to accommodate that for you. And just to make things a little bit easier uh, for those of you who are shut in and, and can't get out. Pastor Paul also provided a really good um, sermon guide on the book of Mark. That came with the weekly um, high five, uh, pardon me, that was distributed to the same group uh, that, that gets the weekly high five. And so 
If you would like to have that sermon guide so that will help you, like just prompt you through the sermon and just help you think a little bit deeper about some of the things that are being shared, again, contact the church office and they will be glad to add you to that distribution list so that you can have a, um, a study guide just to help you through some of these, uh, these times of, of worship and study together. I would like to invite you now to join us in opening prayer. Our call to worship this morning is from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. And now faith, hope, and love abide, and these three, and the greatest of these is love. God of gods, we come to worship today to hear your good news, to hear stories of faith, hope, and love. We know that doubt, fear, and hatred are everywhere and can shake even the strongest. Shape us into faithful, hopeful people, and fill us with your love that passes all understanding. And we pray this together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
will work side by side and we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride and they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are Christians by our love all praise to the Father Good morning. I'll be reading from Mark 8, verses 31 to 38. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it, but... If you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Over Christmas, I had some time to do more pleasure reading, and one of the books I read was a biography of Catherine the Great. Those of you who are interested in Russian or Mennonite history may remember her as the Empress of Russia at the time that the Mennonites moved to Russia in the 1700s. The biographer who wrote this one was sympathetic to Catherine and her desire as a young princess to become a leader who would govern benevolently with the interests of the people in mind. What struck me reading as the story unfolded was how difficult it is if you have position or desire it to truly think of the interests of others above your own. Always you will be tempted to guard self-interest. I think we've seen that tendency play out over the last weeks in our own country and also in our neighbor to the south. And we must confess, sometimes we're focusing on others and the outrage we feel over their selfish manipulations and we can easily overlook our own. How remarkable in the face of this universal tendency is the example of Jesus Christ to give up the ultimate position, to be emptied of self and to give all for the interests of others, ungrateful as they were and are. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, let us see you clearly so that with undimmed eyes and vision, we may follow you on the way to the cross. Amen. When we left off our Mark series before Advent, we had been encouraged not to miss our visitation, 
not to fail to recognize Jesus. We finished off with the story of the disciples' response to Jesus in Mark chapter 8, and that's where we are again this morning. At last, it seemed that they saw clearly. They have recognized Jesus. Peter speaks for them when he says, You are the Messiah, the anointed one from God. And in Mark 8, verses 31 and following up until 10, verse 52, Mark unfolds for us what happens next. We see the subtle hand of the narrator as Mark carefully crafts his telling of these stories. Peter's confession of Christ might seem like the climax of the story. Finally, his disciples understand who he is. But this is not the end. It is merely the midpoint of the story. Our text today begins with, Then he began to teach them. This confession marks a change in Jesus' ministry and teaching. Now that his identity as the Messiah is out in the open, he must shape their thinking about who the Messiah is and what he will do. And the disciples are not ready for this. In this way, they are perhaps like the blind man whom Jesus healed in this odd two-stage healing earlier in chapter 8. Do you remember that one? Jesus uh, touched his eyes, I think. Let me see. Yes, he put saliva on his eyes, laid his hands on him, and asked, can you see anything? And the man said, well, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. And Jesus had to touch him again for him to see clearly. That's what the disciples are like at this point. They see, but what they see are trees walking. They need a second touch, and we'll see a third and a fourth from their teacher to truly see and understand the way of the Christ, the way in which they must follow. Three times in the next chapters, Jesus predicts his death. Three times the disciples demonstrates in their response that they have failed to understand this very clear teaching and they reveal the temptations that they are experiencing. And three times Jesus must correct their misunderstandings, teaching them about selfless humility, discipleship, and servanthood. And today we're going to look at the first of these three stories in Mark chapter 8, 31 to 38. So you'll find the other two stories in chapter 9, verse 30 to 37, and chapter 10, verse 32 to 45. So let's begin in Mark 8, 31. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. They're going to experience suffering, or Jesus will experience suffering. He will be rejected by those who consider themselves the elite, the leaders of the Jewish people. Then he'll be put to death, but three days later, he will rise again. In this first story, the disciples' failure to understand comes through Peter. It is Peter who displays his ignorance. It's the disciples who hear Jesus' stinging response, and it's the whole crowd who get the lesson. So, you know, you have this thing Peter says. Peter took Jesus aside Jesus had said all this openly, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Well, what's the context for that? Why in the world would Peter think he had the right to rebuke Jesus? We don't have this in Mark, which is interesting because we believe that Peter is the one who relayed these stories to Mark. 
He doesn't choose, apparently, to tell Mark this story. It would have maybe put him in too good a light. But in Matthew's gospel, in his account of the story in chapter 16, Peter is given these incredibly affirming words from Jesus after he identifies Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus says to him in Matthew 16, 18, You are Peter, or Petros in Greek, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The play on words with Peter's name and the word for rock in Greek, Petros, Petra, identifies Peter as key to the building of the church. Jesus also says that he will give him the keys or authority of the kingdom of heaven. And now, in this heady rush of authority, Peter presumes to tell the anointed one what God's will is and rebuke him for what he has just said must happen. Why does Peter think like this? Well, Jewish theology highlighted the prophecies that spoke of the Messiah as the one who would judge the nations, avenge, break them with a rod of iron. And thus the expectation they had was of a militant Messiah, one who would rule with political power. And I wonder if we still fall for this temptation today. Peter wants Jesus to be this Messiah. What Jesus is saying cannot possibly be what God has in mind. Jesus, however, understood that the path of the Messiah would be that of the suffering servant in Isaiah chapters 40 to 55. And he recognized Peter's rebuke as a temptation to avoid this way of suffering, the way of the cross. This was the temptation to seize power, to use it for his own advantage. And it is the age-old temptation that Jesus has already said no to. Peter, the one he's just made the leader, must be rebuked in the strongest of terms. This influence must not spread. And so as he turned to Peter and saw the other disciples standing there with him, he said to Peter, but I'm sure loud enough for them all to hear, Get behind me, Satan. Whoa. I, didn't you just tell me, Jesus, that I was the rock? on which you would build the church? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. This is just like Satan's offer in the wilderness. I've already faced and overcome this temptation, and I'm not giving into it now. Peter, Peter, you're thinking like a mere human. You have no understanding of the ways of God. Do we ever try to tell God how things should or should not be? It's time for Jesus to correct some misunderstandings. <clears throat> he now calls the whole crowd along with the disciples to hear what he has to say. There are those who have been with him personally and intimately for three years, and there are many others who have seen some of his miracles. Maybe they've heard some of his teaching. They're interested enough to hang around. He's got fans. He now wants to know if they will be followers. Jesus teaches them that his is not the way of power, but the way of the cross. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves 
take up their cross, and follow me. If you want to follow Jesus, you need to begin by denying yourself, taking up your cross, and follow. What does it mean to deny yourself? I think there's been teaching that we've had sometimes that maybe has made us look at this in the wrong way. I think to deny yourself is to say no to the false self in order to be able to say yes to God. It is to live in the spirit versus living for ourselves. It is to take that self as God and put it in its proper place, which is dead. It is easy for us to be impressed by Jesus, to want God in our lives in some measure, but still on our own terms. To continue living a self-centered life, to carry on with the false self, now religious, but still alive and kicking. To deny yourself is to embrace a life of absolute submission and dependence upon the Father's will. This is the life that Christ himself lived. He humbled himself before God. And because he lived with his eyes on the Father all the time, it was possible for him also to humble himself before people and become the servant of all. You know, sometimes you might think, Well, Jesus, I understand denying myself and serving those who are really loving and very spiritual themselves and kind of those people I look up to, but there are some people in my life who, like, I'm way above them spiritually. I don't know about denying myself for those people. Look at the example of your master. He is above everyone, and yet he humbled himself, took on the form of a servant. He became obedient to death, even death on the cross. He was was the one who could have said, I don't need to think of your interests above my own. And he humbled himself. He could do so because he had humbled himself before God. To take up our cross is a call to prepare to die. Having denied ourselves that false self, we really have nothing left to lose. We don't need to hang on to our lives, even physically. For it is the indwelling Christ who is living his life in us. This is the radical freedom Jesus is calling us to. And I want to point out that this is not an elite spirituality. This is not something just for those super saints, those people really close to God. Jesus is talking to the crowd. This is the way to eternal life for all would-be followers of Jesus. Look at what Jesus says next in verse 35 to 37. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who will not deny themselves and prepare to die because they hope to save or to hang on to their lives, will ultimately lose their lives, their souls. Ed Neufeld, a prof I studied under, said that this is Mark's version of John 3.16. In John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Oh, sorry, I should read the translation you're looking at. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, 
but have eternal life. Well, this is Mark's version of that. This is how you get life. Life is in Jesus. You have to hold on to Jesus more tightly than you hold on to your life in order to truly gain life. I think Jesus may be thinking back to Psalm 49 verse 7 here where it says that there is no price you can give to God for a life. A life is of immeasurable worth. You can't pay for that. You can't get that back. You can only give that life to God and in giving it up, find that you have saved it. We must put our lives to the service of Christ and the gospel. Those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the good news, this is our one goal. It might help us to remember that this gospel, when it was written by Mark in the early 60s, was written for Christians in Rome who were most likely suffering under Nero's persecution. A brutal Roman emperor who took sadistic pleasure in putting Christians to death. There's a real danger that they would be tempted to deny Christ. And so Jesus gives this final warning. Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Belden Lane says that Jesus was able to accomplish his mission in a world intoxicated with its own glory because his own glory meant nothing to him and the Father's glory meant everything. And that is the only way we can accomplish the mission he has given us. Ultimately, our hope is that in following him through suffering, in refusing to be ashamed of him, we will follow him to glory. This warning might frighten you because fear and shame have held you back from fully identifying with Jesus in some situation. I want to encourage you to take courage in the experience of the disciples. Peter himself denied Christ a short time after this warning. He said, I don't know this man. Yet when he humbled himself after the resurrection, Christ restored him. And Peter would go on to write to the church and remind them that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And this was a lesson he had learned in his own life. Many years later, in his final years in Rome, Peter encouraged the church in his letter to follow the example of Jesus the example of doing good and accepting the suffering that might come with that, entrusting themselves to the one who judges justly. It does not matter what any human being thinks of you or says about you. To suffer with Christ is not a disgrace, for when his glory is revealed, we will be glad and shout for joy. You can check this out in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 13 to 19. Peter had learned the lesson well. The other encouragement for us in this, I think, is that in all these teachings, there is a modeling by Christ. We are not called to any place of suffering or serving where our Lord has not gone. And we are not called to do this in our own strength. As we humble ourselves before God, we will be filled with the life of Christ, with the spirit of Christ, who enables us to die to self, to take up our cross, and to follow him. On the way to the cross, 
Jesus teaches us that his kingdom followers will be marked by humble suffering, emptying out of self and servanthood. You know, as I was reading the story yesterday again and reflecting on it, I was thinking that despite this world's talk of and desire for love, we are not much interested, actually, in surrendering to love. We want love on our own terms, controlled and measured and given out only to those who deserve it. We don't want, as the singer Rich Mullins termed it, the reckless raging fury that we call the love of God, a love that loves enemy and gives up all self-interest for the sake of the other. The political news events of this week and the resulting media and social media chatter reveal, I think, that no matter your political stripe, there is a refusal to love like that. This lack of love reveals a void deep in the human soul. We cannot have love on our own terms. We surrender to this love, this one who is love, or we die. Jesus told Peter that the gates of Hades, the realm of death, won't stand against the church. These gates will be broken down and the captives released, but this is going to happen not by brute power, but by the loving sacrifice of God himself. Those who would follow Jesus and be his disciples must follow him to death. Death to self-interest, to pride, to controlling others, to a measured love. Those who would follow Jesus must be radically abandoned to God and radically available to others in love, as Robert Mulholland has said. Death to the illusory false self, but life in the glory and love of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. Against this life, this light, this glory, the gates of the realm of death cannot stand. Those who embrace the glory hidden in the shame now will welcome the blazing glory of the coming king. May this be true of us. Do you pray with me? Gentle and humble Jesus, we are both drawn to this sacrifice of self-interest and repelled by it, to be honest. To know love as you knew it, emanating from the core of your being, radiating from the joy of obedient fellowship with the Father, is a great draw. We see in you that this is no grim and sour sacrifice. That kind of sacrifice comes when we still think that self-interest is our best, given up grudgingly to satisfy the demands of one higher. But your sacrifice is a joyful, yes, your interests above all else, for therein lies true glory and true life. Teach us this way of surrender. In the little at-home decisions where we are spending so much of our days now. And in the larger decisions that impact our involvement in the world. Suffering and death are not terms or states we are fond of. But help us remember that the only thing dying is that which is passing anyway, the false self. What is coming to life in you, Christ, is our true life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, 
is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you, Arlene, for that challenging and very relevant word for us from the Gospel of Mark. This week, Arlene will be welcoming students back as they begin their second semester at Steinbach Bible College, and we are so grateful for the gift that he has entrusted to her and that we as a congregation are blessed with. And so we want to pray for Arlene and the other teachers and professors that will be resuming classes and also the students but all of us have so much to put into practice this week, and I invite you to pray together with me. Our great God, we thank you for your scripture and how by the power of the Holy Spirit, it came alive for us again this morning. Father, many of us in our province, but across the world are grieving and burdened by the continu continuing pandemic and all its implications. We are hopeful for the vaccine and for things to change, but in our province, we have the news again that two more weeks. So Father, we pray that you would give us the sustaining power to remain vigilant and careful, that you would continue to fill our hearts with love that overflows and that we are able to care for one another even in creative and new ways. Give us the courage to pick up the phone, to stay in touch with each other. Acts of kindness ways of showing that we care. And as we've been challenged this morning, that we would continue to be able to put others before ourselves. But most of all, Father, we pray that you would teach us and that we would be able to live out this incredible truth that if we try to save ourselves, if we try to look out for ourselves, we will lose it but it is as we give our life completely to you, trusting in your goodness and your grace. As we surrender, we find life. Father, we pray for those that are caught up in the turmoil and the anxiety. Oh, all of us are so prone to not act in kindness and in love, to be quick to judge, and so, Father, help us to seek love, to seek peace in all of our areas of our life. And now I invite you to pray together with me the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I send you with these words. May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on your life's journey. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands teach us to serve each other. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart be your love forever. When you go out, may you see the face of Jesus in everyone that you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Jesus in you. Now let us go to love and to serve our great God, even as we love and serve one another. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you for joining us for this worship service. I pray that it has been a blessing to you. And if there's any way that we can help you further, encouraging you in your walk with God, don't hesitate to call the church office at 204-257-2500 or by sending us an email at info at moregospel.org.